People of God, let us gather to worship and praise God's name. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> this is a momentous day as we return to in-person worship. Thank you for being with us, whether you are sitting here in the sanctuary or joining us online. We are grateful for both of these avenues to be together in God's presence. As we are all keenly aware, this continues to be a strange time. Wearing masks, social distancing, not being together, not singing in worship, that's really hard for me. I would ask and encourage us to have tremendous grace as we do our best to love one another and be a community in new ways through this time. For those who may not know or Maybe you've forgotten, my name's Tom Abbott. I'm blessed to be one of the pastors here at First Presbyterian Church in Salida, and I have the great gift of sharing that pastoral role with Hillary Downs, and together with Liz, we'll be leading this time of worship today. A few things about our life together. First, gathering together like this will be a work in progress as we learn how many people are going to be with us in worship and as we observe how it all works being together and as we learn our new technology which isn't quite up and running but will be by next week we hope and so today's service is very bare bones next week it will be a bit different and it will probably be a bit different the week after that we all will be learning together I want to remind us that we will continue to be wearing masks as we are in this space, except for whoever is speaking or playing or, or leading up front. When the service is over, the ushers will uh, release you row by row, starting at the back, and we ask you to please go directly outside uh, and enjoy each other's company while social distancing out there. 
If you would like to make a financial gift to the church, there's a basket in the back, and you can continue to do that online as well. Thanks for all the ways that you continue to support the church through this time. Second, we want to thank everyone who participated in the rummage sale yesterday, whether that was by donating stuff or selling stuff or setting up or, or working yesterday or helping get things torn down yesterday. Thanks to everyone for your support of our youth mission trips. Third, this summer and fall is a great time to be engaged locally, so Amy Barden is putting together opportunities for us to participate with Habitat for Humanity. If you would like to, to do that, please contact Amy. Fourth, Hillary's Soul Food Reading Group will be meeting this Thursday to discuss the book, Love Anyway, An Invitation Beyond a World That's Scary as Hell by Jeremy Courtney. I don't think you wanna miss that discussion. And finally, don't forget the Bible study opportunities on both Monday nights and Wednesday mornings. All are welcome to join us by Zoom. Well, as you know, we've been making our way through Matthew's gospel, and we find ourselves in a section where Matthew links five stories to illustrate the four different soils from the parable of the sower. This week's story relates to soils that are like rocky ground or weedy ground. In other words, soil that has had a receptivity to God's word, but then gets distracted from following God's word. As we consider the nature of those kinds of soils, listen to these words from Psalm 143. Listen to this prayer of mine, God. Pay attention to what I'm asking. Answer me. You're famous for your answers. Do what's right for me. But don't, please don't haul me into courts. Not a person alive would be acquitted there. Save me from my enemies, God. You're my only hope. Teach me how to live to please you because you're my God. Lead me by your blessed spirit into clear and level pasture land. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Good morning. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Holy God, we try to fix and to fasten you but you, Lord, will not be bound by us. You are love in motion, always breathing us into being, calling us to serve, sustaining us in the wilderness. Lord, come to us this morning and soften what has grown dry and bit brittle in our hearts. God, we confess that we so often believe that we are capable judges of power and wisdom and goodness, and that we can trust our own standards, separating and categorizing and judging the performance of others. And we fail to trust in your power. We fail to watch for you working out your purposes. So Lord, we pray that you would heal us and transform our hearts, make us new. And God, as your forgiven people, trusting in your grace, we ask for your wisdom to open our hearts and open our minds to your word to us today as we seek you with all that we have and with all that we are. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, uh, verses 13 through 21. So let's listen to God's word for us. And I'll be reading it from the message. When Jesus got the news about John's death, he slipped away by boat to an out-of-the-way place by himself. But unsuccessfully, someone saw him and the word got around. And soon a lot of people from the nearby villages walked around the lake to where he was. 
When he saw them coming, he was overcome with pity and healed their sick. Toward evening, the disciples approached him. We're out in the country and it's getting late. Dismiss the people so they can go to the villages and get some supper. But Jesus said, there's no need to dismiss them. You give them supper. All we have are five loaves of bread and two fish, they said. Jesus said, bring them here. Then he had the people sit on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish, lifted his face to heaven in prayer, blessed, broke, and gave the bread to the disciples. The disciples then gave the food to the congregation. They all ate their fill. They gathered 12 baskets of leftovers. About 5,000 were fed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As I mentioned at the beginning of the service, we're in this section of Matthew's Gospel where he has placed five stories consecutively for the purpose of highlighting the four different soils from the parable of the sower. The four soils represent different types of receptivity to God's Word. As humans, we fluidly move between these four soil types. Last week, you may remember that we looked at two stories that exhibited hard path receptivity. In other words, no willingness to open up to God's word. This week, we consider a story that gets us reflecting on the rocky soil and the weedy soil. Those two soil types both have an initial receptivity to God's word, but then something hinders the listener from moving toward transformation or toward action. Today's story, as we just heard, is the feeding of the 5,000, the only biblical story that's in all four of the gospel accounts. 
The line from our story that caught my attention was, when Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. Other translations, like the message that Hillary read, use the word pity rather than compassion. Today we want to consider what gets in the way for us of having compassion or pity for the situation of other people. From Jesus' teaching, fertile soil is soil that loves one's neighbor well. I would guess that 100% of us listening have heard the call to love our neighbor. None of us are a hard path there. All of us listening today have some receptivity to Jesus' command to love our neighbor. But are we actually fertile soil? Every day is our heart transformed a bit more so that our love, our compassion, our pity for our neighbor expands and grows and leads us to action. Our story begins, when Jesus got the news, he slipped away by boat to an out-of-way place by himself. As Hillary mentioned, the news that Jesus received was that Herod had executed John the Baptist. There is a very good chance that John the Baptist and Jesus were the closest of friends. We know for sure that they were cousins. We know that their mothers were close friends. We know that Mary, Jesus' mother, looked to Elizabeth for guidance and help. We know that Joseph died sometime between Jesus being 13 and 30, so if Joseph had died when Jesus was younger, it's not out of the realm of possibility that Mary and her children moved in with Elizabeth and her children. We also know that Jesus and John's ministries were interconnected. Jesus and John were close. When Jesus learned of John's execution, he was filled with grief, so he snagged a boat to go off by himself. Many of us find solace on the water, whether we are rafting or kayaking or fishing or just sitting on a rock alongside watching the river flow. Many of us also know the healing power of water. Like Jesus, many of us know the pain of having those quiet moments of solace interrupted. Unlike Jesus, we may not respond with compassion to those people who have interrupted our time of solace. But Jesus did. Jesus had truly developed a heart for his neighbors. Even in the midst of his great grief, Jesus had compassion for them. When Jesus looked out at the crowd, he immediately recognized their need. Rather than staying in his boat or rowing somewhere else, he landed and began ministering to those needs. For Jesus, his compassion directed his actions. Now, as you may have noticed, the story doesn't give us any clue as to when or how the disciples showed up there, but all of a sudden we know that they are there as well. And his first thing that we learn about their time there is that as soon as their stomachs began to growl, the disciples lost patience with the crowd. The disciples' compassion had reached the end of its rope. The disciples had reached their limit for loving their neighbor. So they came to Jesus and said, you know, Jesus, we're out here in the country, and it's getting late. Let's dismiss the people so that they can go into the village and get some supper. The disciples tried to phrase their statement politely. They couched their words of exit with grace and poise, but 
Basically, they were saying, we're done with the messiness of these people's lives. Let's send them away. Basically, they were saying, the idea of loving our neighbor sounds great. It's a really nice ideal. But to put it into practice is just a bigger hassle than it's worth. Let these people figure it out on their own. Let them pull themselves up by their sandal strap. You see, this is where the rocky or weedy soil creeps into this story. The crowd all of a sudden became a them instead of an us. Whenever our language refers to a person or a group of people as them or as those people, then we have stopped considering them as neighbors. When that happens... We look at them and no longer have compassion. Like the disciples, we simply want to be done with them. We want them to go away. Every church that I've been involved with buys bus tickets for people who are in need. And every church is so glad to buy bus tickets for people to get out of town. But we rarely buy someone a round-trip ticket. As humans, it's so easy for us to shift from a worldview of us to a worldview of them. Of course, the biblical view is that every person is a precious child of God. From the biblical perspective, there is no them. There is only us. Jesus looked out at the messiness of the crowd and he was filled with compassion. The disciples started with compassion but grew weary very quickly. Quickly they wanted to send the messiness of the world away. Quickly the us became them. That moment of transition from us to them is when fertile soil becomes rocky soil or weedy soil. God's word calls each of us to pay attention to when, to how, to why this shift takes place within us. What happens in you, what happens in me, when our language shifts from us to them? This week I want to challenge all of us to pay attention to how often people, precious children of God, are referred to as them. Whether it's in the news, in tweets, in posts, in conversations. As followers of Jesus, we want to grow in our compassion in referring and thinking and acting toward people as us rather than them. After the disciples expressed their desire for the messiness of humanity to go away, we read this little interchange. But Jesus said, There's no need to dismiss them. You give them supper. All we have are five loaves of bread and two fish, they said. Can you think of a more vivid image of us than inviting people to join us for a meal? This is radical hospitality, inviting people to be with us, to commune with us. Jesus invites everyone to the table. For Jesus, there is no them in the crowd. There is only us. The disciples, however, responded to Jesus' call for everyone to join in communion in the exact same way that we see every day in our communities, in our nation, around the world. The disciples said, but there isn't enough. (laughs) Excuse my language, but that's simply bullshit. That's simply a lie. A lie we see perpetuated in our personal relationships, in our churches, in our communities, in our national politics, in our international relationships. 
There isn't enough. The disciples, weary of the crowd's messiness, fell into the common perspective of scarcity. A scarce perspective is rocky soil, is weedy soil. A scarce perspective is not fertile soil. This story challenges us both individually and corporately to consider when we slip into this perspective of scarcity. When do we find those words, but there isn't enough, rattling around in our heads or even making their way out of our mouths? A church building is a great asset for doing ministry. A church building can also be a tremendous idol. A church building is a great place to commune, to offer radical hospitality, to live out a worldview of us. A church building can also be a place to park the Subarus and express our perspective of scarcity. The walls of a church building can become the defining point for a us or them perspective. They are too hard on the carpet or on the chairs. We can't afford cleaning after they've been here. Our utility bill is too high when they use the building. The Salt Lake Valley has seven PCUSA congregations. I hadn't been serving in the valley very long when one of the neighboring pastors called and asked if we, the church I was serving, might be willing to host a congregation of Chin refugees. Salt Lake is a national refugee city. The LDS community does an amazing job offering hospitality to the world. I had the great gift just a couple of years ago of being in a little room at the state capitol building when Republican Governor Gary Herbert read to the press his letter to President Trump expressing Utah's opposition to President Trump's policies opposing the welcome of refugees. Before this present administration, Salt Lake welcomed hundreds of refugees every year. Because of that, there are seven Chin congregations in the Salt Lake Valley. The Chin are a group of people from northern Myanmar, formerly Burma. Some of the Chin became Christian primarily through the work of the American Baptist Church in their region. Most recently, we've heard of the genocide being carried out against the Muslim people in Myanmar, but in previous years, it was carried out toward the Christian groups like the Chin. The Chin people speak a number of different dialects. Understandably, they prefer to worship in their own dialect. The Chin congregation hosted at the church of my, that my friend served had a group of about 40 people who spoke a different dialect from the other Chin congregation that was worshiping in that place, and they were wondering if there was another church that could host them so that they could worship in their own dialect. Thus the call that I received. Would we, the people of Cottonwood Presbyterian, be willing to share our building with this growing group of Chin refugees? The session readily said yes. But it wasn't long before the grumbling began. Most of the Chin refugee became refugees when they were teenagers. Then they spent seven or more years in refugee settlements in Malaysia, and then they were finally settled in the Salt Lake Valley as 20-somethings. The refugee congregation that we were hosting quickly grew to about 100 people, mostly in their 20s, and so they were getting married and having children. And there was actually a herd of very young children in that congregation. There were as many young children as there were adults. A herd of young children is going to 
usher in a wear and tear on the building different from that of people mostly in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. For a few in the Cottonwood congregation, that Chin congregation quickly became a them rather than an us. Of course, we know how the story about feeding 5,000 ended. There was an abundance left over. There were 12 big baskets overflowing with leftovers. It's kind of like everything that shows up at a rummage sale. There's an abundance in our communities. Thanks to God's faithfulness to us, there is plenty to have a worldview of us rather than a worldview of them. Friends, when our words shift from us to them and our perspectives change from abundance to scarcity, we know we are shifting from a place of fertile soil to a place of rocky soil or weedy soil. As a congregation, let us be a people who are aware of these shifts that take place within us. Amen. Let's take a moment of silence as we reflect on this, par on this story of the feeding of the 5,000 and what it means for our lives as Liz plays.
Let us pray. Holy God, we do not know how to pray, but Jesus invites us into the life that he shares with you, so we keep coming. God, receive us now in our frailty, in our complacency, in our desire. God, we pray for your church all over the world, that we would be seed and yeast where life has grown empty and heavy. May the life that we discover in you connect us to each other and to the world that you love so much. God of mercy, give us wisdom and give us courage beyond our imagining. God, we pray for those in unsettled places, for those whose needs are overlooked in the choices of the powerful. May we who know such privilege have open hearts and open hands. Lord, we pray for all who stand at the thresholds of life, for those who are soon to be born and for those soon to go home to their life with you. We pray that you would guide their journeys and bless those who love and who hold them. And may your peace be upon them. God, we pray today for those who grieve, thinking especially today of Danny and his family at the death of his stepfather this week. God, surround that family, surround Danny's mother with your comfort and your peace. We pray today, Lord, for all of those who are in difficult positions of leadership at this time of pandemic. Lord, give them wisdom and discernment in the midst of this wilderness. May they lead the way well through uncertain times. And may we all work together in this world for the health and the benefit of others, no matter who they may be, seeking to love as you love, seeking the highest and best for other people. God, we pray for friends and for loved ones who are fighting cancer and other illness. We pray for those who are recovering from surgeries. God, we pray for bodies to be cleansed of unhealthy cells. We pray for the knitting together of wounds. We marvel, Lord, at our bodies and how you have made them so beautifully, so perfectly. We thank you, Lord, for the gift that they are. God, we give you thanks for new faces to love, for ideas to ponder, for work to do. And we marvel at the sturdy friendships and the persistent memories that sustain us when the way is difficult. May they always remind us of your love and your provision. Holy God, keep calling us into the world, your world, as seed and yeast and treasure, as good soil. Equip each of us for the challenges that we will face until we learn to worship you in the most unlikely places. For you are the source of our song. You are the deep well from which we pray. And we do pray together the good, strong words that you have taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, as we go back out into the world today, let us be thinking about when we shift from us to them in our language, when we shift in our minds from a perspective of abundance to scarcity. Let us really wrestle with this story 
of the feeding of the 5,000 and what it means for our lives together. If you would, let's join in our benediction that we have been saying together, if you know it. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has a purpose in you being there. Christ who indwells you has something he wants to do through you. Believe it and go in his grace and power. The peace of Christ be with each of us. Blessings on the rest of your day. And look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks for being here today.